This is Dr. David D. Shine, and welcome to this special Saving America panel discussion on mass violence in America and what we can all do about it. And I want to underscore right up front, this is not a political discussion. I don't know that any of these terrible mass killers have ever asked anyone what political party they're in or who they vote for. And I do think that the people in Washington, whether they do something or don't do something, is not going to change the community situation. And that's what we're going to focus on. What can we as Americans do to make the situation better. And we've got some terrific panelists today. Dr. Heather Williamson specializes in performance management organizational development through Transformation Group, LLC. For the past 14 years, she has worked with a diverse array of clients in an effort to provide the highest quality executive coaching so her clients can create high performing teams. She's the number one best-selling author for her book, Magnetic Trust, How Great Leaders Keep Top Performers and Get Extraordinary Results. She also provides leadership tips and strategies on her new YouTube channel. Dr. Williamson earned her BS, MS, and PhD in psychology from Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. Dr. Williamson has been active and held leadership roles in many associations, including the Powhatan Chamber of Commerce and Executive Women's International. She is a returning guest to Saving America. Thank you very much, David, for the very amazing introduction and to really be a part of this team. Um, I really am coming from, because of my psychology background, really focusing on the mental health aspect of why we see so many murders in the United States. And amazingly enough, and which is really sad, is that you know, there are, have been so many instances and a lot of the instances, yes, the person may have been diagnosed and been on some kind of antidepressant, which believe it or not, I had recently read an article and 97.8% of mass shootings also really occur in gun-free zones as the, uh, because obviously people know that they're not going to be having anybody come, um, really fight them against this. And also with the antidepressants, it's really the selective serotonin, re, the reuptake inhibitors that are really causing these challenges. And there is, if you look at the labels of let's like, say Prozac, or there's another one called um, FXR, on the warning labels of this, in the literature, in the um, information packet, they are, are actually known for suicidal ideation, violence, and homicidal ideation. They're all known side effects. So you wonder if these, why mental health is not being looked at more frequently. And, or, you know, it's so common to say, all right, well, it's either the gun or the vehicle that's causing the murders, but it's really comes down to the individual. And for whatever reason, there are also signs that these, these individuals are really not where they need to be with regard to their mental health. For example, Virginia Tech shooter, we remember that. That was um, back in 2007. And it was, and I'm gonna pronounce his name wrong, but Sung, Hugh Cho. And he unfortunately killed 32 people and wounded 17. But there were signs long before that this happened where it could have been addressed. He could have been, you know, people could have taken the initiative and really stepped in. And he had symptoms of depression and anxiety and concentration. And he was actually treated as a young adult. But he had, um, he had stages, he had signs where he had posted and written in school assignments that he wanted to repeat Columbine. He was a junior in college and he had written professors and classroom behavior where uh, professors said that it was disturbing. There were also instances where he was investigated by the university police for stalking and harassing female students. 
And there is, um, I call it a, well, they're calling it indicators, but it's the critical aggression prevention system, indicators of emerging aggression. And that, they stated in this um, article, which if you really look at all the different things that, for instance, he did, or just recently the, uh, the uh, Valdez um, school shooter, Salvador Ramos, you know, he was a bully, he was bullied and he was a loner and he actually bullied as well. Uh, he had stopped attending school regularly. He made ominous messages on social media. He just hours before the shooting that he was going to kill his grandmother and um, shoot up an elementary school. He cut his face for fun. He would shoot at random people with BB guns. So there are signs that the people who are going to commit this horrific crime have challenges and but nothing is being done about it really I mean you, they may go they may get diagnosed they may they may not he was not he was um he had now he was gone as undiagnosed with a mental health condition and even had been arrested at 14 for planning an attack the same attack that he committed um and just for example, Daryl Brooks Jr., the uh, Waukesha, Wisconsin. I mean, he plowed an SUV into a Christmas parade, killing five and wounding 60 other people. He also had a criminal past and posted anti-police rhetoric on social media. So there are signs that these um, individuals are really hurting and that they really need help but there are, there's nobody taking action, which I think is really very sad. And, um, and so why don't people take action? It's because one, they don't know what to look for, or two, they don't see it as in their best interest to take action or do anything about it. Or maybe they think that they could become a victim if they do step in and try to prevent harm. And one other thing to really consider, I think, is really the, the loss of God in today's society. If you look at churches these days, and there's plenty of information out there. In fact, I looked it up before this. Church attendance is decreasing. And a Gallup poll, just a recent one, in 2020, 47% of people attended church. And this is whether it's a synagogue, church, or mosque. 2018, 50%, and then 1999, 70%. So, and this is really because there's no real, real affiliation or preference for any kind of uh, specific church to attend. So it's at its all-time historic low. And when you break it down, 36% of millennials, this is, this is affecting where they have no religious affiliation, 50% of baby boomers and 50% of Gen X. So the millennials, you know, the, are really struggling with this. There's, and, and it's because there's a declining role of religion in elementary schools and secondary education. There's also higher ed, there's an increasing hostile uh, environment really when it comes to expressing religion. And also when it comes to Christianity, we see this uh, consistently. And when you think about the wokeness in church these days, so the, I just saw yes, the other on Sunday, maybe it was, where the Episcopal, well, the, this has happened uh, a couple months ago, but the Episcopal church is now talking about reparations. And then the um, there's a bishop, a Catholic bishop uh, was taking away the Catholic uh charter, let's say, because it was raising the, the LGBT and the BLM flags on their Catholic school campus. So it's the, it's the undermining of values is, you know, they, I think people these days are not, the church isn't providing the value system that they personally have. And so there's that lack of God in people's lives, because, you know, where are they going to go to get it? And in, in addition to just the the, the psychiatric impact of medication out there and how it is impacting the, uh, the, the people these days. An interesting fact that I thought it was 
1989, just two years after Prozac came to market, um, Joseph Westbecker shot 20 of his coworkers, killing nine. And then he'd been on Prozac for one month and then the survivors end up suing. But then two, day, two decades later, between 1998, or 1988 and 2008, antidepressants use in the U.S. rose by 400%. And by 2010, 11% of the U.S. population over the age of 12 were on an antidepressant prescription. So, you know, in some cases, I think it's just easy to say, if you have these five symptoms, you're express anxiety, or you're withdrawn, or you are feeling worthless, um, sadness, you know, they're all in the DSM, um, uh, DSM five categories, the assessments, then, you know, you must be depressed. And if you are, have experienced this in most of the day or every day for two or more weeks, it's kind of hard to make that assessment when you don't know what's going on in a person's life that may be causing this. You got to get to the root cause. So just something to think about. And when it comes to uh, the majority of, of the patients who receive that depression diagnosis and then the prescriptions afterwards, it's, it's, if people stay on it and they don't learn the coping skills that are needed in order to think a more positive life or take action to you know, get maybe the, the people that are causing you depression or causing you to feel like your self-worth is low out of your life and get surround yourself with more positive people and talk to people. People, you know, there are people who are just don't wanna talk to you. You don't feel, the person doesn't feel like that person wants to hear what, you know, that I'm not happy. And you don't want anybody to do the harm that has been happening in this, in the world lately. Well, I think right. that's uh, a, a, a very good conclusion is that uh, we certainly need to take some action. And we have Dr. Jacqueline Kerbeck is the founder and president of USA Global TV and Radio. She has interviewed over 1,500 people in the last two years. I've been fortunate to have been interviewed twice recently on her network. Last year, she published an Amazon number one bestseller, Behind the Green Screen, and this year released Adversity to Awesome, which I'm presently reading. She holds a PhD from the University of Phoenix in business administration, holds a BS and MS in finance, from Penn State University. She focuses on the power of listening and encourages people to pursue a healthy lifestyle as a yoga master and encourages meditation, which I think many of us could benefit from. Hello, my name is Jacqueline Kerbeck. I'm known professionally as Dr. Jacqueline. I am the founder and president of USA Global TV and Radio, and I also am known as the listening mentor. I teach people to listen at an elevated level, and I certify them. This has been my mission to have people learn how to listen at an elevated level. I have found that with what's going on in the world, not just in the last two years, but leading up to that, people are no longer fully present when engaging with other people. There's so many distractions in the world and we fall prey to them many times. And as a result, in my experience working with people as a certified coach is that people feel they are not being heard. And when they're not being heard, there are feelings of resentment, feelings of anger, anxiety, not being good enough. And it is possible and has been shown that these feelings manifest themselves in many ways, ways that can be dangerous, ways that can be unhealthy, ways that can impact our mental health wealth. My goal is to make sure that people understand when you learn to listen at an elevated level, you will be experiencing deeper connections, 
better relationships and more authentic conversations. And isn't that what we want? But in order to have those things, we have to look at our own behavior when it comes to our listening patterns. And listening starts with ourselves. It starts with listening to our intuition. It starts with personal development, realizing where there are areas that we have that are growth opportunities. And when we are able to find these growth opportunities, it is possible for us to find our passion, to live and work in our passion, to find that inner peace that I spoke of earlier. I work with people, as I mentioned, in the way they can become certified as an elevated listener. This is through the program that I have developed. It's called The Power of Listening. The Power of Listening is an opportunity for people to watch role plays and see people in action, paid actors, as well as team members that I have here at USA Global TV. When we watch these role plays, many times we can see ourselves in the role play. Maybe that's happened to you, a situation on the television or watching other people. If you ever people watch and you see something unfolding and you say to yourself, oh, I know where this is going. I've been in that situation before. Well, this is an opportunity to break those patterns and to be fully present and engaged. I teach people how to set boundaries as an elevated listener. And when we're listening at an elevated level, we're listening without judging the other person. How many times have you had a conversation with someone and all of a sudden you say something and they just switch off? They switch off because you're pro-vaccination and they're not. They're pro-Republican and you're not. They're pro-abortion and you're not. They're pro-gun control and you're not. And all of a sudden, nobody is listening to the other person. They've labeled you, they've judged you, and they've checked out. Or how about listening and not providing a solution? This happens. I'm speaking about something that happened to me and the other person thinks, oh, I know what she needs. I have the answer. I have the solution for her. I didn't ask for a solution. I just asked for you to listen. Listening without interrupting. How many times are you talking and the person, well, but uh, I, well, no, that is not elevated listening. And finally, the one that I call the dreaded stage hogging. You're sharing a story when I was in college, X, Y, Z happened to me. Oh, when I was in college, this happened to me. And now you no longer are even telling your story because the other person stole the stage from you. These are things, these four traits that people do are what I truly believe are causing a major dysfunction in this world. Instead of celebrating each other, lifting up humanity by fully listening and being present, we're in our own body, in our own mind, we're not actively listening. By taking the approach that I am offering to people of learning how to be an elevated listener, getting certified as an elevating listener, holding a safe space for people to share their story, I believe that we are creating inner peace and are one step closer to world peace a world where we are not judging what the other person says. Someone feels differently than you, that's okay. That's what makes this world a beautiful place. Different cultures, different perspectives. Let's listen to what the other person has to say. When you are feeling that you're unheard, unlistened to, don't manifest it inside. Meditate, do yoga. Find something that gives you the inner peace and say to yourself, recognize, congratulations, I'm aware of the fact that the other person doesn't have the same level of listening skills that I have. I'm going to give them grace and I'm going to make them aware of how I felt. Joe, I feel like you are not listening to me. I don't feel like I'm being heard. And the reason is when I'm speaking to you, you're on your phone. When I'm speaking to you, you're looking away. When I'm speaking to you, your eyes sort of glaze over. How can you and I communicate at a more effective level?
So in closing, my goal, my wish, my mission is for us to respect each other, hold again that safe space for people to share their comments, their feelings, so it doesn't escalate. It's not years of being unheard that turns into something tragic, that turns into mental health dysfunction, that turns into something where we feel isolated, depressed, filled with anxiety. I'm asking you to open your heart, open your mind, and open your ears to support a world of inner peace and elevated listening. Thank you for your time today. And we also have Scott Paradis, uh, retired as a colonel from the U.S. Army after a 30-year career, which included tours around the world in the U.S. He served as a congressional fellow with the United States Senate and as a national security fellow with the John F. Kennedy uh, School of Government at Harvard University. He holds a Master of Science in Administration from Central Michigan University and a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology from the University of New Hampshire. He's the author of multiple books, including Sheep Herders Wolves, I have that nearby me here today, and Explosive Leadership, uh, and I am using that book in my MBA capstone course, and the students have responded well to it. Scott facilitates people moving between limits by showing them how to think deliberately and productively. He has also been a prior guest on Saving America. Well, th thank you, David, for, for inviting me and giving the, me this opportunity to join you about this topic. Now, I, I agree what with what Heather had said about the mental health, more drug use, more prescription drug use, uh, the isolated nature of people in the health, the mental health conditions of folks who perpetrate violence. I just want to give you a couple of numbers to kind of put things in context. And this, I'm not trying to frame this in a negative way, but oftentimes when we have this discussion, we talk about guns and the number of people who die because, and they say, uh, or guns are used that end up people dead. And so, so just the big numbers, These, this is 2020 numbers. We had 45,000 people die related to a firearm. Now, most of those were suicides, about 24,292, and about 19,400 were homicides. So we, we see there's more homicide deaths in the United States as a ratio than most other developed countries. The conversation always turns to the number of guns. So if you look at number of guns in society, another interesting statistic, we have more guns than we do people. More guns than people in the United States. It's about 120 guns for every 100 people, roughly 400 million guns in the country. Again, the guns aren't to blame for somebody pulling the trigger. It's the people who pull the trigger is what we need to be focused on here. But I just want to kind of give you some context to that. Just also in context, we lose about 40,000 people a year to automobiles. So again, no one's blaming the automobiles. There, there are some circumstances, but you, know, you understand what I'm saying here. It's not about the technology, it's about the people and how the people use the technology. So going to our, our gun situation, I'm from Alaska. We have the highest percentage of folks who own guns in the country are in Alaska. And I go out quite often hiking and quite often I see people carrying guns and they're carrying guns quite publicly and quite out in the open because I, where I go hiking, it's bear country and people realize that they could be attacked by bears. So people carry guns and, and it's not a threat to any human being. It's just this is the circumstances. And this is the reality of where we are. When you look at gun ownership in the country, we have about 42 percent of households have guns. And many of those people were brought up with guns. Some are sports shooting, some are hunting, so on and so forth, ha have guns. So a lot of folks have guns and the fight always becomes take guns, keep guns, take gun, keep guns. And really, I think the focus, like Heather had said, is really on the risk of violence. In the big picture of things, this is not the most violent of times. If you look at the statistics, we are not at a higher rate of violence than we have been in the past. As a matter of fact, the rates of gun violence were higher in the 70s, the 60s, 70s, and of all crime, highest in the early 90s than they are today. 
So we have had a declining rate of violent crime in the United States. So it's been declining. The challenge is, of course, any event that does happen, it gets huge media attention and does draw all of our attention. And they're very tragic events, very tragic events. But it comes back to, from my estimate, personal responsibility and what we are doing as a society to address isolation, disconnection, and mental health issues, the same things that Heather was talking about. So when we look at what causes us, first the question is, do we, are we individually, do we want a less violent culture in the United States? But on the face of it, we would say yes, but when you start saying violent culture, we start talking about all the things that we, I would say, you could say that we support or that um, celebrate violence. And we could talk about anything from entertainment, the entertainment media, what Hollywood does. We could talk about video games and our obsession with shoot 'em up video games. We could talk about our sports in some cases and violence in some of those fields. We could get into a number of ways that we relate to each other, but the question then comes down to, do we want a more civil culture and how do we do that? So part of it is the mental health issue of individuals, but really it's the health of our culture and our society. And we seem to be disintegrating. And Heather talked about that, you know, disintegrating our, our religious cultural base. We're disintegrating the family. All of those things are coming apart. And so the fabric of society is unraveling as well. Now, but put that in context of crime is at large decreasing in total. So things are in fact getting better. It just depends on the perspective. We are nowhere near perfect. We still lose 40,000 people a year related to firearms. We lose 40,000 people a year related to vehicles. So how do we try to reintegrate or tie our fabric back together again? And so just a couple of thoughts here. One is we've got to make a decision. Do I want a less violent culture? Would I want a more civil culture? Am I willing to change and help advance that? Because all change is personal. It always starts with an individual and always ends with an individual, and it's always an individual decision. It always revolves around what we think and how we think. So it's our thoughts, translate to our words, translate to our actions, but it all begins with our thinking. The first place to address that, I would say, is reintegrating the social fabric. One of the places to start, now this is, this is a sort of low-hanging fruit, we have religious organizations that are still intact, and so do they have an interest in reaching out across ecumenical lines, if that's the case, or across religious lines, and start connecting with people? I, I was, as I was researching for this, I said, okay, we, we talk about freedom. Well, you actually, the more freedom we have, we have the freedom, if we want to, we can be free, we can connect, we can collaborate, we can cooperate. That's, in my mind, an ideal or we can be free to isolate and enclose and engage ourselves if we want to. And unfortunately, the folks who engage in violence are the latter rather than the former. They are deciding to isolate. And we have a lot of things in society that promote isolation to get inside this little box that they then see the world from a very small perspective. And it's up to us to begin opening that box and begin reaching out. So religious groups could reach out, social groups could reach out. And this is just to have a dialogue. I'm not talking about necessarily the mental health issues that Heather was commenting on. I'm talking about just us being more civil with one another so that we understand that somebody might have a different perspective. Let's talk, let's understand each other's perspective and we will all grow from the experience. So I, I get we have, Everyone likes to point at guns as the problem. It's not guns that are the problem. It's people that are the issue here and it's how we think. And it's our thinking that takes us down either a negative path or a positive path. What we need to do is connect, collaborate, cooperate, communicate, all of those C things so that we can understand each other better and reweave the fabric, the social fabric so that we understand each other rather than then lashing out rather than focusing on fear, which is counterproductive as, as, a, as, a, as a basis for tying us together, bring, this, bring people together so that we can understand each other better and we were less likely to then, when we do recognize folks who have mental health issues or have isolated themselves or in an echo chamber that is negative, we can recognize that and act. That is what I would advocate for us as an approach 
to helping uh, bring down these incidents of really catastrophic violence. Well, thank you so much. And um, I'm gonna put in my five cents worth here. Uh, you know, we, with inflation, it's marked up from two cents, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> But uh, I wanted to, to focus on a couple of the uh, nuts and bolts things that I think that we could do, uh, particularly at the local uh, level. And uh, one of the areas I, I'm concerned about is simply that uh, across the United States in many major cities, we've uh, elected district attorneys who have been releasing people. Uh, there's a... Uh, uh, an explanation there that we're locking up too many people of color and it's not fair and they're they're spending more time in jail than other people are and i think it has uh, largely backfired on our society and there there are a lot of individual killings that could be addressed and and while we're talking about mass violence i think also we need to appreciate the fact that we seem to have a more violent uh, culture uh, in my early career, I was in-house counsel for um, a, a large oil company, and we had hundreds and hundreds of retail locations. And um, it was very rare back then for anyone to be shot. They would give up the money and the robber would leave. And what has happened more recently is uh, a lot of these small stores, when they're robbed, the perpetrator kills the person at the counter and other people in the store. And it, it, it's, it's happening all over the United States. The concerns that, that I have that I'm suggesting is that if someone uses a gun in a crime, that they be denied bail or that bail be set very high. If they discharge the gun, that they be completely denied bail. And that we, we begin to have a, uh, and I know it's a cliche and it's not intended to be a cliche or political, that we need to have more of a law and order society that people need to respect each other. And part of the reason for a legal system is to have a sane and well-ordered society. Uh, I also think we need to do a better job and we hear this a lot with the police department. Um, uh, sadly, each day that goes by, we hear more and more about mistakes that were made in the Uvalde, um, um, the, the horrible shooting in the Uvalde schools. And it does look that the uh, police and the guards who were there um, did not act in the best interest of these uh, children. Um, I believe there's a proposal in Congress that would include funding for hardening schools. Um, of course, schools famously are, are no, no gun districts uh, as uh, Dr. Heather mentioned. And this is, uh, you need to have somebody there and it's, it's kind of interesting. There is an active debate about whether having uh, armed guards at schools is helpful or not helpful. Um, I kind of like to think that we should move our society in a direction where we don't need them. But I think at the moment that it's, uh, it's probably a good idea but these people need to be well-trained and they need to interact with the students and, and gather the respect of the students. So I, I think that's something that we, we could do. Um, there, again, it's a part of the proposal pending in Congress is to improve our red flag laws. The, the reason there's controversy about red flags is this person who we might red flag might be somebody else's not red flag. And so we, we have not sorted that part of the subjective decision out. But I do think that, uh, uh, as has already been mentioned uh, today, that we have a lot of people out in our society who absolutely positively should not have a gun and they should not be able to buy one legally. Um, we also need to do a better job of enforcing our terrorism uh, watch systems. Uh, one of the things that was mentioned that's not received a lot of attention is this uh, young man in Uvalde, the shooter, um, purchased 400 rounds of ammunition, which is an unusually large quantity. I mean, even if you're going hunting for a whole week, uh, you might carry 30 rounds or something like that if you're really bad shot. Hopefully you don't use that many even in a whole week of hunting. 
but that it seems to me that somebody in Homeland Security should have been alerted when somebody buys that much ammunition at one time and is not um, responsible for, uh, uh, does not have a reseller's license or something like that. And uh, speaking of reseller licenses and the administration paying more attention, there was recently a case brought up that this fellow, and I believe he's now been arrested, but he had purchased 92 handguns over the course of a year, all of them legal, but then went on to sell them in Baltimore and in Canada and other places. And they know that because since they were legally purchased, the serial numbers are traceable. And so uh, it seems to me that we could do a better job as somebody in Homeland Security could say, gosh, this guy's bought them off. And I don't think it should get to 92. I think, you know, somebody buys, you know, five or 10 uh, guns at one time uh, or in a short period of time, again, through the legal system, the legal purchase system, somebody ought to be paying attention to that. And then uh, one of the things that we hear frequently is that our uh, shooters, especially these multiple shooters, have been bullied either at home or at school or at work. And we certainly, we may not be able to monitor as much in the home front, but certainly teachers could do better monitoring uh, uh, bullying in school. And we as employers, and I work with, you know, with, with businesses, uh, is to do a better job of monitoring bullying to make sure that people feel that they're more evenly treated and to try and avoid some of this resentment, which on top of use of uh, antidepressants and feeling isolated and everything else, uh, having a sense of resentment can certainly be that final motivator that causes someone to, to engage in, um, in violence. With that, let's, let's open it up to everybody. Let's, let's talk for a few minutes, uh, exchange some ideas uh, about uh, uh, other things that you may have thought of while we've been talking today. Uh, one of the topics that I, I thought we might want to talk about as a group is uh, maybe a way to have a no fame system. And I, I discussed this with a, a high school teacher last night and he was very intrigued. Uh, he's doing research on bullying right now, working on a paper. And uh, we talked about it. And uh, uh, one of the things I mentioned was the no fame concept that we don't identify any of the mass shooters or persons who shoot celebrities um, in the media, that the media have an agreement that they will identify these people. So what do you think? I think that is, is a great idea because that's sometimes that's the motivator behind the person that does the killing is that they want to go down in, you know, in history as being famous for making that um, obviously poor decision, but that, that violent act. And I think that if you take that away from them in the beginning, and the same thing happens when you've got these bystanders who are seeing violence being perpetrated on individuals who are just minding their own business and they're recording it all on their phones you know it goes to that level as well yeah that's that seems like such an incredible lack of sensitivity and I, i've heard a number of reports of, of bystanders using their phones to record things which can help the police but if if some poor person is being beat up and the purse is you know being yanked off their shoulder and stuff. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm not a particularly big guy, but I, I don't know that I could stand by and watch someone be beat up or, or be harassed or something and not step forward and say something, you know? All right, it would be very difficult for me as well. And I'm like five, three. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree with, the, uh, with, with Heather on that, no fame, no fame rule, if, if somehow that, that agreement so that we could eliminate some of the, I'm going to get famous this way in a, in a very bad way, uh, take that off the table. I think that's, that's, that's one, at least one factor that would become uh, taken off the table. I did want to throw out, and, and I know, and I, I get this, I know, you know, Dr. Heather's from a military family, 
what about public service? And this is just is the idea. And the reason I bring this up, and, and I, I realize we've long, we've gone from a conscription army back in the 70s, and I get we're all, all volunteer force, but we have had these conversations about public service. And the reason I bring it up here is this idea of bringing community together in the military, as an example. I'm not saying this has to be just military service. It could be public service of some sort. But you get people from all walks of life, now it's all young people in this case, but to come together from different parts of the country, different perspectives, and they meet people from different parts of the country with a different perspective and, and, and learn and grow through that experience. Have a shared experience, national service of some sort, but the idea behind that for me is to build on this, this uh, weaving our fabric, our social fabric. What, what do you think of that? Dr. Heather, you want to respond first? Um, I was taking notes. Um, let's see. So <laughs> weaving the social fabric. I, I, well, you, you know, in schools these days, uh, they have a requirement for volunteer service. And I think that's one way that they're trying to get their students involved in doing something other than staying at home, watching video games or being on their phone, talking to their friends. So I think that the first steps are there, but then, you know, you've got to get the parents involved to make that commitment, which is a great idea because I'm, I'm a big proponent. My um, best friend has a, a nonprofit where she works with those who have um, trying to prevent substance abuse. And that's the same thing. You know, they they could, they fall into a depression. They turn to drugs, whether it's from being addicted from surgeries, whatever the reason is, um, if you get people involved in trying to help somebody else, that might trigger those that value system of, hey, I'm trying to help somebody be better or trying to help somebody, you know, make their life a little better. And maybe that will start triggering something in their brain where they're not trying to uh, take away from that person. Yes. You know, I was thinking at a national level, but every time, every time I come up with a solution or, or an idea, there are unintended consequences. And here we then mm -hmm. have a bureaucracy to manage all of those things and so forth. I'm just, I'm just trying to think of back in the draft days, like I said, you'd bring somebody from Brooklyn, meet somebody from lower Alabama, and they'd realize mm -hmm. they're not that different. And then right. all of a sudden they'd have a shared experience that changed their life view. Mm -hmm. But you got to start locally. Yes. Yeah, no. Yeah. yeah, I appreciate that. And and yeah. and really it's this idea of being willing to listen and not put ourselves in this own our own echo chamber. Right. Exactly. And, yes. and we and we do have a lot of shared experiences, but again, unfortunately, a, a lot of times our, our, our students in our school system um, are you you end up with a lot of clicks are formed. And, and, you know, there's the cool kids and the athletes and the not cool kids and all that. And to try and encourage, a, 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 you know, a better environment uh, in our schools, I think, is, is a good starting point. And maybe to increase, I, I remember that even at the time of the draft, the promotion of uh, Peace Corps and uh, AmeriCorps and things like that, and I certainly think there are things like that. And I know some of that has provided an incentive. Uh, I know there's been a lot of discussion of uh, student loans and things like that, but uh, people that teach in uh, low income areas or that perhaps uh, volunteer for some of these uh, more systematic government volunteer systems like the Peace Corps would get some uh, uh, credit towards their uh, uh, educational loans and that that might provide an additional incentive because uh, I, I also think it helps in terms of America's uh, image around the world that I think we, we had a better image at some point in the past when more viewed as as helping people not just the United States but elsewhere now I know you you opened and, and you opened with this is not a political discussion and I, and I get it and I don't want to say a write a political discussion, but we, we tolerate things now that we would never have tolerated in the past that would not have been civil, polite conversation or, or presentation 
well, we can we do it in music, we do it in entertainment, we do it in our groups, even in the language that we use, our political leaders now and how they present themselves in the language that they use. It's all now acceptable. Mm -hmm. So what if we now here, this is this is a big can of worms. <laughs> but what about going back toward civil, polite conversation? Mm -hmm. And I think we call that, yeah, the kinder, <laughs> the kinder, gentler society. And and you've hit on a couple of points that, that are some of my favorites. And I, I'd love to say I never use profanity, but that would uh, that would not be true. Uh, but I can tell you that uh, in posts on I'm on multiple uh, social media uh, platforms, I never, ever use profanity. And if someone uses profanity to comment on one of my posts, um, we sometimes delete them if we can or we ignore them, but we do not respond to people who, who use uh, profanity. But profanity has become so ingrained. And, and of course, I think it supports something you said earlier, Scott, about uh, violence in video games and movies and, and Hollywood. It's hilarious if you think about it, is that a lot of the big anti-gun people are also these big stars in Hollywood. And it's like, don't you think about that movie, Arnold Schwarzenegger, where, you know, you, you beat up, you know, 15 people and you shot a bunch of people and you don't think that desensitizes people to the, the concept of human life and, and, and violence. So, I, I think there's certainly a lot of room for us to be a more uh, uh, civil uh, society. And I'm sensitive that I taught at a historically black college for three and a half years back right here where uh, Dr. Uh, Williamson is. And I can tell you, I remember one day I was crossing the uh, main part of the campus and some um, African-American student yelled out the N word to another group of African-American students. It's like, no, guys, no, 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 no. The rest of us know not to do that. But uh, I don't listen to rap music and hip hop and stuff. But I know there's an extraordinary amount of misogyny, uh, profanity, and, uh, um, and use of, of the N word and things like that. And it's like, you know, folks, as part of having a more civil society, I, I don't think that's the best way to get there. I agree. I, I'm going to throw one big idea out at, at, at you just to, to hear your thoughts on this one. And this is in the social media vein, because you're, you're big in that world, David, so, so you understand this as well. And this is this idea of anonymity. We have really millions of accounts that are bots, so not even human beings. And then we have millions of accounts where we don't know who they are. There's no way to identify who they are, where they are, or, and many of them have multiple accounts. So part of my contention or points are that, that if we would remove the anonymity or reduce it as much as possible, we would be more likely to converse civilly than when they're hiding behind some persona that's that's completely created or is a digital persona anyway, and then they can launch all this vitriol out at anybody and any anyone in the world, and that helps further isolate and, and uh, break down society. Heather, did you want to speak first on that? I think you make a really good point, Scott. And you know, it's interesting when people and you think about when you're working in teams, right? If you have the opportunity where you allow people to share their opinions and in a non obviously non-threatening way or you know you're going to be respectful that's the whole thing is there's just a lack of respect yes and yes. especially when you can hide behind that um oh you know that digital picture of yourself that's not even real person and you can be somebody who you might want to be but that you're not a you're are not competent or brave enough to do it with your real picture out there. And it, on it, and it comes back, I think, to um, God as well. I mean, pe people would learn to treat people the way they want to be treated, you know, with respect and be valued and appreciated. I think we would also get along a whole lot better. But with the social media and that anonymity, 
yeah, you are a lot uh, braver of voicing your opinions when people don't know who you really are. Right, right. Yes, that's a good point. Well, first of all, of course, I, I'm on multiple social media platforms, but I am me, myself, and I, and uh, uh, absolutely not. But it's interesting because just this past two weeks, uh, Elon Musk, uh, who's looking at buying Twitter, has asked Twitter to indicate how high the percentage of bots is or fake IDs. So that's not the, quite the same as people pretending to you know, using a, a alter ego, but uh, the concept's pretty close. And the Twitter admits that at least 5% of their participants are bots, meaning that they're created by computers and systems. And Musk has indicated he thinks it's closer to 20%. Um, one of the things that's happening on LinkedIn that's very interesting is that a number of us, generally men, have been approached by what appear to be very attractive Asian women who claim to be in Los Angeles or New York, generally, um, who claim to be uh, fairly wealthy and who, who want to um, connect with you. And then they go on to um, uh, attempt to get you to uh, participate in different uh, cryptocurrency platforms and trading. And it was real interesting because uh, uh, I, I played along with this for a while. I've also discussed it, by the way, with the FBI. So just, just you know, I'm, we're, we're not chumps here. And we certainly never gave anybody any account numbers or any money. But it's interesting because uh, there's starting to be more of this kind of weird stuff happening on the internet. And, uh, and I think it's important that we act to uh, identify them. And I've actually, in the last few days, put out some tips to my uh, fellows uh, readers on LinkedIn in terms of, of being uh, careful. Uh, one of the reasons that what came up was about a week ago, somebody said the same photos are being used that these diff it's different names and yes. they may be in New York a lot, but it's the same set of photos of very attractive um, Asian women. And so uh, we're also concerned that it may be some part of a, a CCP uh, plot to, to get people uh, uh, identified or compromise certain information. But it does appear based on my current survey that it's largely uh, crypto scams. And, and we really don't know who the people are behind it. And that is one of the problems is, is with the exception of people like the three of us uh, here at the moment is that it, it's quite clear that we are who we are and we're promoting our books and we're promoting our, our services as consultants and trainers and so forth. But um, there's an awful lot of people out there who are not, not as easily verified, I guess we would say. Yeah, it's not an easy thing. And, and I think part of that, when we look at one of the things that struck me and what, what Heather had brought up about the number of prescriptions <laughs> that are being used by perpetrators of violence. So there are a whole lot of areas we need to look at as a society. To, but at the same time, we wanna say, we wanna be free to do our own thing. So it, to me, it comes back to that question that I posed, do we really want a more civil society? And if we're serious about it, it starts with us and what we do, the decisions we make. Right. And just to, to add to that statistic, um, Scott, so this is at 484 drugs in FDA's database, 31 were found to account for 78.8% of all cases of violence against others. And 11 of those drugs were antidepressants. Wow. I know, it's, it's scary. Yes, yes. So, and we're at a time in life where uh, my PCP, my, my general practitioner doctor, uh, does a depression survey, which he started a few years ago, uh, each time you went in and uh, uh, he looked at my survey and he said, yeah, you're depressed, so what? All of us are. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, and, and I'm not on antidepressants, by the way. <laughs> and, uh, but it was pretty funny what he said. But, uh, uh, you know, we, this was uh, a year or so ago. We were talking, you know, in, in the more of the COVID period. And uh, not that we're not still in the COVID period, but um, I, I think, if anything, that unfortunately that the uh, last couple of years with COVID have encouraged more isolation and less socialization. And, and I'm hoping that uh, we, we come back out of that. I saw a, a very odd news clip uh, earlier today that Neil Diamond um, the well-known uh, rock star uh -huh. uh, from past generations, apparently was at the Boston Red Sox game wearing a Boston Red Sox jacket. And uh, uh, the, the stadium appeared to be very, very full. So uh, hopefully those people are being kind to each other and uh, <laughs> Um, are rooting for the home team, but nice to the other guys and so forth. But I, I, hopefully we're, we're entering a period where people are going to be able to get back together more. And um, I've got my fingers crossed regarding that yet another round of, uh, of COVID, but uh, so far so good. Well, here's, here's a thought. Now, now this is just kind of, kind of tongue in cheek, but you, you saw over the weekend, they canceled all kinds of flights again and stranded travelers and everything in this holiday weekend. So we need to strike up an opportunity at those airports where all those people are ending up having to sleep to have actual times to interact with one another in a positive way. So it seems like travel industry is setting us up for challenges. We need to, what is, what is it? We need to make lemon, uh, how does it turn lemons into? Lemonade out of lemons. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So opportunities are bound. There yes. are always opportunities. We just have to open our eyes. Yes, yes. yes. But I, I think that's interesting. And certainly uh, airports are, you know, some of the least friendly places. And on top of that, and certainly heading in the wrong direction, uh, Delta Airlines announced last night that they're going to limit people in their lounges to three hours before their flights. And they're saying that uh, uh, there are too many people are kind of check out of their hotel, go to the Delta Lounge, and then camp out for the rest of the day, and uh, that they they feel like they're abusing the, the systems. But uh, as the newscaster pointed out, people pay for that privilege. <laughs> to use. Uh, I know the United Club membership is about five hundred dollars a year, and um, and it's not for the great food. I can tell you that. Uh, <laughs> But uh, we, we might do that. Well, listen, folks, any last words? Yes, we, you know, we try and always be respectful of everybody's uh, uh, time. And I think we've covered some great points, uh, but I want to give each of you a chance to uh, make some uh, closing comments. Well, I would just say that, you know, starting tomorrow, it's a brand new day. Uh, hopefully the sun is shining, but even if it's not, you know, we're above ground and not below ground. So hopefully that we take that gift and really focus on, you know, how we can help somebody else, especially when you see an opportunity where somebody needs it. I'd like to share one slide in closing. This slide just gives you a little bit of information about some of the ways I help people listen and provide education, entertainment, inspiration, and hope. It's through the Power of Listening foundational courses, and you can sign up for them on drjacqueline.thinkific.com. Also, the Listening Mentor TV show, which is on USA Global TV. You can sign up for that after you become a certified elevated listener. So it's a two part, the power of listening first, get your certification, and then you can be on the TV show. And also through the books that I've written behind the green screen, which is really my personal story of how and why I left the corporate world and started a live TV and radio broadcasting platform with no experience whatsoever. I started out being interviewed on the radio and I took over the show and now I brought it to television and we have 26 on average uh, each week, 26 live broadcasts. My second book is Adversity to Awesome. This is a compilation with 11 other authors. Each of us has a chapter that is something that is incredibly, uh, an incredible 
chapter in our lives filled with shame, filled with fear, filled with all kinds of negative emotions. And yet we were able to embrace what happened to us and turn that into opportunity and success to help others. And finally, I am working on a children's series of books, seven books in total to teach children and their parents how to listen at an elevated level. The first book is called The Amazing Adventures of Lady Ella, the Listening Mentor. And all of the animal characters that you see here are representative of elevated listeners, people who have become certified as to how to listen. And they are going to help us teach children and their parents how to listen. So in closing, there are many ways to become more mindful, more present, more giving, more caring, and be a better listener. And I'm here to help you with any of those. Thank you again to David Shine and his team for allowing me to be here today. I'll just close with this thought. Trust is the key. Trust is the key in all dimensions of our social network. And the best way to build trust is to ensure you are trustworthy. Mm -hmm. So there you go. That's where I'll leave it at that, David. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much for joining us. And this has been a special edition <laughs> of Saving America regarding how Americans can address the issue of mass violence. This is Dr. David D. Shine. We really appreciate you joining us. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on your favorite platform.